Welcome to Calf Academy, your source for calf care education. The basics of milk replacer. So as we think about milk replacer, it's important that we look at all aspects of it. First, we need to establish what's important in a milk replacer, the major and minor ingredients that can go into a milk replacer, the different manufacturing processes, how those processes and ingredients affect the mixability of the product and other product information. We must first look at what's important in a milk replacer. We'd have to look at quality, consistency, service, and price. People will argue of which order those four should be in. If we look first at quality, we must think about the ingredients, but also the final product. For consistency, we must look at the consistency of the powder and how the product performs each day. Small animals, including calves, lambs, goat kids, and others, thrive on the consistency of their feeding program and also the powder that's delivered to them. We want to make sure that the powder smells and looks the same in every bag and also performs the same each day. Service. This is one of the most important areas when evaluating a good milk replacer from bad. You must have a resource when something goes wrong with the product or if you have a health concern, you've got to know who to turn to. And finally, price. We must be competitive in the market. We understand that, that there are all kinds of different prices when it comes to evaluating milk replacers. Some are very low cost and some are very premium. And it's important to understand why those are what they are. Lots have to do with the manufacturer, the quality of ingredients that are made, and the margin expectations and the number of steps in the channel that a product has to go through in order to get to the end consumer. So let's first talk about the major ingredients in a milk replacer. When it comes down to it, there's really three major types of ingredients that are in a milk replacer. First are milk proteins, fat sources, and vitamins and minerals. So as we look at milk proteins, there are several different ways that you can slice and dice milk proteins in order to come up with a milk replacer. Some of the most common milk replacer ingredients are certainly byproducts of fluid milk and cheese production. Dried whey, for example, is typically 12% crude protein and anywhere from 60 to 75% lactose. Reduced lactose whey, often called DLAC, is typically 23 to 24% crude protein. Whey protein concentrate, another very important ingredient in milk replacer production, will typically range to be either 34% or 80%. And what you'll find is that manufacturers of the whey protein concentrate will specify which one that they're actually going to make. Different manufacturers make different types of whey protein concentrate. Finally, dried skim milk or non-fat milk is another popular ingredient that we put in milk replacer. Certainly not as often as the top three. Um, we certainly see the top three being the very major ingredients when it comes to the dairy proteins. Dairy proteins make up a gigantic amount of the formula along with the fat source that's in the product. So as we evaluate a product, for example, the fat source, it's going to be, if a product is a 20-20, it's going to be 20% protein and 20% fat. We want to look at fat sources that are whey protein encapsulated, and we'll get into a little bit of that um, in a few slides to really understand what that means. Um, we also often will see liquid fat that is applied during manufacturing for dust control. Also, another major category of milk replacer manufacturing are vitamins and minerals. It's important to provide the calf what he or she needs in order to have optimal performance. And so we closely follow the NRC guidelines to make sure that we are adding the appropriate amount of those vitamins and minerals. In evaluating ingredients, we must look at both quality and consistency. As we talked about earlier, you can't put bad ingredients in and hope to get a good milk replacer back out. So in that effort, all suppliers at milk products are pre-approved Ingredient quality and consistency is extremely important. As we talked about earlier, we can't put low quality ingredients into a milk replacer in hopes to get high quality ingredients back out. Therefore, milk products focuses very strongly on our suppliers. Every supplier is vetted to make sure that they meet our standards. They're also placed on a routine basis. We will follow up with them and make sure that they've maintained those quality standards that we set in place with them. We also do third-party visits to their facilities to make sure that 
and what they say they're doing is actually happening. Ingredient monitoring. Each ingredient has quality specifications. We rely heavily on our suppliers to help us understand what those quality specifications need to look like and what our expectations should be for each of the ingredients. All ingredients are inspected upon arrival and each ingredient goes under specific testing and monitoring. This is all part of our regular quality control processes and protocols. So again, as we look at a microplacer formulation, it's important to understand the different components. So first we talked about dairy proteins. Some of the other proteins that we see in microplacers, again, we talked about milk or dairy proteins. Um, we also see synthetic amino acids being used as a contributor to the protein source. Plant proteins, which can include soy or wheat-based plants, and also animal plasma. These are really the four major types of protein that we see in a microplacer. When it comes to fat, most commonly is going to be animal fat, and milk products is most commonly going to use lard um, in, their, in their fat basis. We also use vegetable oils, sometimes for the calf's benefits, and other companies will use vegetable oils to lessen the cost of the product. We must recognize that all of these sources can come in dry versus liquid in the fat. Carbohydrates are equally as important to evaluate when it comes to milk replacers, as well as vitamins, minerals, and additives. Vitamins, minerals, and additives is really where the customer or the end user is able to really specify what it is that they want in a milk replacer. We talked about the importance of the VTM, or vitamin trace mineral premix, that the small animal needs in order to have optimal performance. We also take a serious approach to the different additives that are offered in the industry. We try to build good relationships with our suppliers, dig into the research, and really understand and be able to separate the good from the bad when it comes to milk replacer additives. Keep in mind that not all additives in the feed industry can be added to milk replacer. They must be water soluble and must be reliable. When we look at milk fractionation, how whole milk can be fractionated out into different parts, it really starts with the two basic ways of how you're going to use whole milk. These are commonly known as the separation and the cheese making industry. Separation being the fluid milk and cheese making obviously being the cheese that we've learned to love to eat. So as we look at the byproducts of the separation, that's where we get our cream on our way, which then are taken one step further and we get our lovely byproduct of butter. From a milk replacer standpoint, the way from the separation fractionation is really what we're looking at. We're drying that down and that's where we're getting the skim milk. Casein can be another, another dairy protein that's used. We don't see it nearly as often as some of the other ones. It is a byproduct of the separation portion of whole milk. Much more commonly, our ingredients are coming from the cheese making portion of whole milk. So that's where we're getting, um, as you can see here, that's where we're getting the curds that go into cheese. And also then um, from that cheese, same cheese making process, we're getting more whey that we're then drying down, crystallizing, or sending through an ultra filtration process. And we are able to, to slice and dice that into several different types of proteins that we talked about earlier. Again, we have our whey that is commonly 12% protein our lactose, our delactosed whey, or delact as many people refer to it. We have our whey protein concentrate. Again, manufacturers are targeting 34 or 80% when it comes to WPC. And then we also have whey permeate. Again, we don't see the whey permeate as much as we do um, the other major ingredient, the other major dairy proteins that go into milk replacer manufacturing. So let's talk about the manufacturing process. One of the things that I think is really important to understand is that several manufacturers in our industry have their own definition of instantizing or agglomeration. I'm gonna use the terms instantizing and agglomeration interchangeably, and I'll use the terms dry blend or non-agglomerated interchangeably. So this is the process I'm going to share with you is milk products instantizing or agglomeration process. This is the process you would see for many of our small animal complete milk replacers. 
So what we're doing is we're taking all of those great ingredients that we talked about, the high quality ingredients, dairy proteins, fats, vitamins and minerals, and also any additives that the customer or the end user has specified. We're sending them here through our twin ribbon mixer, which is the first step. That powder, follow the yellow dots that are on the slide. As we take the powder, we're gonna, again, it goes through the twin ribbon mixer. It then goes up the hydration towers. It then falls down into the, what we call the hydrator. It's in that hydrator that atomized water is misted onto the powder. That process, those particles, the water and the powder, mixed together in those hydration towers that look like large grain bins. That powder then falls on our drying beds. We have two drying beds in our facility where they send the process through a hot heat and then a cold heat. When the powder lands on the belt, it almost has a wet snow consistency. And then what we'll see is that the powder then travels on the fluid beds. It doesn't actually sit on the fluid beds. What happens is it travels along sort of like an air hockey table where it just kind of floats across. Air is constantly flowing up into the fluid beds. It's flowing then through the hot heat and then cooling the powder back down. It's really that whole process of adding water to powder and drying it back down that creates the milk products instantizing or agglomeration system. Once the powder is, has left the cold heat process, we are then sending it to the bagger to be bagged and ready for shipment. So as we look at ingredients coming in, we get our ingredients in in both totes and bagged products. Here you see our tote handling system. Large totes are coming in and these would be our major ingredients. We'd see most commonly our fat bases and also some of the major dairy proteins such as whey, WPC, and D-lactose whey. We'd also be adding ingredients via bags. They can range from dairy proteins, um, they can be additives, premixes, whatnot that come in a bag. All of our ingredients are managed through what we call our repeat system. This is the software that we use to ensure that the ingredients that we're putting in to our milk replacers are accounted for and we're put in at the right amounts. So again, we're adding bagged product and toted product. We're gonna add our minor ingredients to the process. These might be things that could include different mosses or yeast products. A variety of additives is available in the milk replacer industry. So then we're mixing the product in our twin ribbon mixer. It's going to mix for just a short time, just a few minutes. The powder then again is going to travel um, from the twin ribbon mixer into the hydration system. So again, as we look at our agglomeration system, again, it's really creating those fine powders that are hydrated with an atomized mist of water. Um, it's a kind of a high pressure source of water. And then just as that mist and the particles combine, they're falling down, um, creating larger particles as they stick to one another. And it's really important to think through that as as snow. As snow gets real wet, snow trends to, to attract other snow particles. Same thing really when we think about milk replacer. And so again, each manufacturer in our industry really has a different definition of what agglomeration or instantizing is supposed to look like and what it looks like in their system. In this picture here, you'll see that those are two fluid bread dryers. Um, they really look like semi-tankers that are, are side by side. Again, they're, they're running product um, simultaneously. Obviously, we have two of them uh, making that process a little more efficient for us.
As we think about our automated packaging line, let's think about first the size that would fit on here. So we're really targeting products that are about 22 to 50 pounds. Um, first, we're gonna fill the bag. Um, we'll see that we'll kind of tap that powder so it makes sure we fit it into the bag. The bag is then sewn and sealed. It's important to have a good seal on micro placers that we have, we really create that moisture barrier. It's at that time that the tag is also sewn on, the bags are laid flat, they're kind of shifted a little bit to make sure that the powder is properly distributed. Um, we're also gonna send that bag through a magnetizer and a weight checker just to make sure that we've met all the specifications that we set out to. If anything is wrong with that product, it will be kicked off during the packaging process. If the product is then date coated and then it travels on to be palletized. For 50 pound bags, it's obviously most typical that we're putting 40 bags on a pallet once the pallet is stacked, we're sending the pallet down the conveyor to our hooder. That hooder is going to put, in place of shrink wrap, we're going to put on the hoodie material. And if you think of it kind of as a large bread sack, it's gonna go over top of the bags of products. Once it's released, it really kind of clings to that product. Um, it, it really has a very strong consistency in order to protect the product. There's been, we've done a lot of testing on that, really understanding the differences between shrink wrapping and hooding the product. And hooding the product really presents um, certainly a better visual, but also better protection for the product. As I mentioned earlier, we also have two small packaging areas. Small packaging areas are much, much different than our large packaging areas in the fact that they are much more manual. Certainly by design, our small packaging area is going to, it's gonna package anything from a laminate and paper bags to also a variety of pails and containers. Um, if you think about some of our electrolyte products, it's common for us to have one product that comes in four different sizes. And so we wanna make sure that when we're making that product, we can easily package any of those sizes. And so we're, we're wheeling that equipment in and out. You'll see a lot of the equipment in this picture here has wheels on it. Again, that's by design. We wanna make sure that we're as nimble as possible when it comes to package sizes. So when you think about the large packaging area, it really is about automation and about um, throughput. When we look at the small packaging area, it's really about what is it that the, how can we slice and dice that same formula into as many sizes as we need, um, also providing our customers with that packaging flexibility. It's definitely one of the areas that we think we have, we are a leader in, is providing those, those different package sizes and types to our customers. So as we look at the mixability of a product, it's important to really understand how well does it mix, how well is it gonna clean up, and again, the quality of the ingredients, the consistency of the ingredients, and also the manufacturing type is really what's gonna play a piece in that mixability. We certainly have prided ourselves throughout the years on the mixability of our products. We believe that it is really important. We totally understand as people have more animals on their farm, they're more likely to have an automated mixer, but we still do believe that there is value in proper and superior mixability. As we think about the mixing overview, we really have to make sure that we're following tag directions. An optimal temperature for, for mixing micro should be between 110 and 120. Um, we really believe that that's the ideal temperature to get fat at a melting point. We also don't want to grease out the, the micro placer because you can certainly separate that fat and what you'll end up with is almost like a cottage cheese consistency. 
agitation is, is equally as important to that water temperature. Again, we talked about how large facilities will typically have an automatic mixer um, on farm, and those mixers certainly have a range in how fast um, and aggressive they can agitate the milk replacer, and it's certainly important to find that ideal agitation. So one of the things to look at as you're evaluating milk replacers is the wettability of the product. Does the product take on water? Um, we should certainly see more wettability with incentized or agglomerated products than we would with dry blend or non-agglomerated products. That would certainly be the expectation. We are looking at, again, how well that product um, should take on water. We want that product to melt into solution. We don't want mixing the milk replacer to be a chore or a hassle for folks. So as you can see, we want those particles to kind of just equally disperse throughout the product. One of the things we'll see is the non-instantized powder versus the instantized powder. On the non-instant powder, we see a larger surface area because the product is more dense. An instantized product, we're covering the product is less dense, so there's there's more air. Essentially, there's more air in it. It has a, a larger particle size. Um, that's one of the things that we, we certainly get feedback from our instantized products is that the bags look very fluffy and that they're, they're very pillowy. And so we don't see that in non-instantized milk replacers. So keep in mind at Milk Products here, we have the capability to do both processes, um, both non-instant and instantized powder. Um, we certainly recognize that there is a time and a place for each of them um, and can certainly help you work through what options we'd have for a particular formula. So again, as we're looking at instantized products, the smaller surface area, we're forming crystals. Um, again, we're, we're developing that kind of fluffier product. So we absolutely want a product that not only mixes good and wets good, we need it to stay in solution after it's mixed. Think about when you're feeding calves or feeding small animals, we're mixing the product in the mixing room, mixing the product in the mixing room, we're taking that product out by the animals, if there's been any period of time that has passed, we want that milk replacer to still be in solution. Um, one of the things that we see is, is sometimes some of our ingredients that we have to use and typically will be medications, is they're not as water soluble as we would desire. We may need to agitate that milk replacer you know, before feeding to make sure that each calf is getting the proper amount of medication. But again, it really is important as you're evaluating milk replacers to make sure that you're choosing one that stays into solution after it's mixed. So let's talk about the, the protein encapsulated fat that's in the milk replacer. The fat that we are using, and I want you to think about it kind of like a peanut M&M. &M. Um, so the, the core or the actual fat gobule is going to be the peanut, and then the protein that's surrounding the fat gobule is going to be the chocolate, and then finally the that kind of harder layer that's on that kind of candy layer that's on the outside of an M&M &M is going to be that final layer on the fat. We really want to promote the, the protein encapsulated fat. We believe that it really does protect that fat from separation and from really creaming and shearing. That's what we talked about earlier is where we see then that creaming and shearing can absolutely, that's what would lead us to like the, that cottage cheese effect. When we think about the emulsification of a fat gobule, um, again, I want you to think about it like a peanut M&M, the center or the fat gobule being of that peanut. So as we look at, as fat is kind of dispersed in a beaker-like setting, the proper agitation would be that the fat is kind of, kind of all dispersed throughout the product. You want to make sure you don't have fat that's kind of stuck to the side of the bucket or to the to the feeder you want we to make see sure the that effects of what it, happens properly when we agitate that it throughout the product um, agitate that milk replacer too hard again we're going to really see in a rapid agitation setting we're going to see that um, that protein pull away from the fat gobule and what you're going to be left with if that fat gobule is is free flowing or it's by itself and not protected by the protein that's really where we're going to see the problems the harder we agitate that 
marketplace. So let's think about the product information. Are, so we've got that. separation. We, so it really we've is a fine high line quality of making sure that put them through that the high quality is properly process. mixed, we've that the ingredients sure that, and the additives uh, are all the dispersed, is good, but that we're not beating the heck out of the marketplace. We're not going to have fat separation. Um, but let's really talk about what you're going to see on a Malkerplacer tag and then how to distinguish when a product was made. A Malkerplacer tag can certainly tell you a lot about a Malkerplacer. It's not foolproof though. Um, there's definitely things about the manufacturing process and also the quality of ingredients that we will never get from a Malkerplacer tag. As we look at a Malker Placer tag, we at Malk Products are, are very serious about making sure that we are keeping up with both AFCO and FDA's rules and regulations when it comes to tag formats, layouts, requirements that you have to have on a tag, the order of those requirements. Um, we take that information very, very seriously. So first off, we want to make sure, and this is a medicated tag, it contains Dequinate or, De or Decox. Um, and so we want to make sure that we've got the right product name on it. It's telling us that the product is indeed medicated. We also want to make sure that we fully understand and tell folks what the proper usage of the product and also of the drug is in that product. So we want to identify who the product is made for. Is it made for beef and dairy calves? Is it made for lambs, goat kids, and so on? And so then we're also, um, once we get past our product description and our, and our purpose statements, we then need to make sure that we're guaranteeing the drug level. The drug level is typically expressed in a grams per ton and milligrams per pound expression. We then go to guaranteed analysis. Now keep in mind there are definitely core things that are required in a guaranteed analysis and then there are things that customers um, could choose to guarantee if they wish. Those things we typically would see as maybe amino acids or additional vitamins or minerals. This tag here is a calf milk replacer. Um, and so the guarantees that we're required to put on a calf milk replacer would be the fat, protein, fiber, um, a calcium minimax, the phosphorus, and then the three main vitamins. Um, again, folks can certainly choose to add more than that. We sometimes will see on a calf milk replacer, we'll see folks wanting to add the ash, um, amino acids, and so on. Keep in mind that when, if we were manufacturing or showing you um, a lamb or kid milk, those guarantees would be different and the requirements are different via AFCO's uh, determination. Next would be our ingredient listing. And this is really where uh, folks hope to have the kind of the magic ball um, to look through when it comes to milk replacers. Unfortunately, um, as we talked about earlier, you can't determine the the level of quality that a manufacturer puts into their ingredients just by looking at the ingredient listing. It's really important to know who your competitors are and where that milk replacer is being manufactured to really understand what their quality specifications look like. Things you can find, however, in an ingredient listing are if they're using specific additives that might be adding or not adding to the cost of the milk replacer, um, such as, again, mosses or drugs, potentially um, prebiotics or probiotics. Also, you'd be able to find if they're using any type of specific proteins that um, we want to make sure to look out for. Some of those may be, again, the animal plasma, um, perhaps a plant protein like a soy or a wheat-based protein. We would be able to find all of those things in the ingredient listing. One of the things we won't find in an ingredient listing is the level of inclusion that those ingredients have. So if we're adding perhaps a moss, for example, um, we muck products are going to just have to put in our recommended levels. We're not going to know based off the tag how much um, of a moss, for example, is in that product. We'll know what's in there based on the ingredient statement. Um, we must also have proper medication and warning statements. A guarantor is also a requirement on the front side of the label or tag. The requirement is that if somebody looks at your bag or your tag of milk replacer, they need to know how to contact you if something would go wrong. A lot of times you'll see customers have their address and, and even possibly their phone number. And then on the right-hand side of the tag, and sometimes it's the back side, um, depending on how the tag is structured, we're going to see the mixing and feeding directions. Um, again, we're really taking those very seriously. We're evaluating those on a regular basis just to make sure that we're giving people the proper direction that they need um, in order to feed the product. We have to be really specific and make sure that anyone could do it if they just picked up the tag um, and read it. And then we also... Um, 
will typically have animal care recommendations. Again, this is a calf product, so this product contains calf care recommendations. We'll typically say things that fall into those calf care recommendations about the use of colostrum, about how to feed starter and how long to feed it, um, the importance of keeping water in front of those calves on a daily basis, the importance of using an electrolyte when needed, and when and how to wean those calves. Um, so we really, uh, we want to give people enough information on the tag, that they really could take it and just feed that milk replacer. One of the things that you'll find on all of our products that leave our building are the date codes. And it's important to know where to locate the date code. They can vary by product. If we're looking at large packages, um, such as 50 pound bags, those date codes are going to be in the side gusset. Um, so on the side of the bag or the side of the pallet, and we'd be able to locate those. We really want to talk to our sales representative if you have any questions or doubts of where those date codes are. If it's a smaller packaged item, it probably is on the back of the pouch um, or, or product. There's two types of date codes that we are most commonly using here at Muck Products. One's going to be an open date code and the other a closed date code. Um, so when we think about open date codes, it's, it's truly going to include the date of the product. The example here in the slide, that product was manufactured on April 17th, 2015. It gives you the exact date that the product is manufactured. Some of our customers have chosen not to go that route because it will sometimes imply or make people believe that that's an expiration date instead of a manufacturing date. And so the alternative to that would be a closed date code. And that's more of a kind of you need a key to detect the date code. This example here, again, it is for April 17th of 2015. A is always going to, both on a closed and an open code, it's going to signify that it was made at our facility here in Chilton. So D then is going to be the month of the year. So we're using A through M with the exception of I. And so, because it does resemble a J, and so we're not we're not using I, but if we if we go with that nomenclature, the D is going to represent the month of April. Um, a being January, B being February, C being March, and D being April. The next number is going to signify the year. Um, so five obviously represents 2015. The next two digits are going to represent the day of the month. So one seven is going to give us that 17th of the month. As we think about our time together today, let's kind of summarize it up. Some of the key take-homes that we talked about today is our mixability or our manufacturing process. We also talked about the quality of ingredients. We truly believe that it is critical for the finished product quality. Also milk replacer tags. We have lots of folks that ask us to help them evaluate milk replacer tags, and we're happy to do that. But keep in mind that a milk replacer tag doesn't give you all the answers. It certainly gives you a lot of them, but it doesn't give you all the answers. Um, as we talked about, the things that you can't get from a milk replacer tag is that protein or fat quality. You also can't get the fat source or the form, the manufacturing process, or the, just the level of quality that they're taking into account when they evaluate their ingredients. Thank you for completing this CAF Academy course. If you have follow-up questions, please contact your Milk Products National Account Manager.